Okay, InDesign. InDesign is open. Uh, obviously on my screen here. File new. Um, document is where where I go for this. So new document. Um, this is the menu that's going to give you all of your options um, uh, for this document. So um, typically it's going to be letter. Uh, so letter um, eight and a half by eleven. Um, identical to all the other menus here. This is uh, important. So facing pages. Um, this is going to determine whether or not you have a single page document or you have a um, um, like a booklet type of a document. Okay, so this is a page layout program um, that's was specifically originated to um, uh, be used for uh, catalog pieces, publications, um, and that and that sort. So um, I'll explain a little bit of that later. Um, but f facing pages is how we created the template document that you have downloaded. Um, with this check, it's a facing page document. If I uncheck it, you'll just have one page right after the other. Um, let me just uncheck it and show you since you've already seen um, what facing pages looks like. I can actually go in here and let's just say I wanted to do like a, a, a postcard, right? So a standard postcard typically is um, nine by uh, nine inches wide by five inches. Um, uh, tall. Um, and then, uh, so another important piece here is your margins. So uh, in uh, InDesign uh, basically will give you uh, uh, border markups around there so you can see what, um, uh, how much space you have from the edge. So a half inch margin is the default. Um, typically uh, for a booklet um, in the gutter, which is basically the uh, center piece um, where the staples are essentially in your folded um, uh, saddle stitched booklet. Um, you won't want to go closer to that um, that gutter than a quarter of an inch and actually I would say probably a half inch is the safest. Maybe on the outside edges of the piece you you could go like a quarter of an inch or something like that for text or any um, any important imagery uh, but of course background imagery um, that would uh, bleed off the page. Um, that'll I'll show you where the bleeds are on that, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about uh, bleeds and so on um, as well. I'll have to get to the board here after this demo. Um, but uh, essentially, the, um, one of the things you'll want to keep in mind is the bleed. Um, if you want artwork to kind of come off of the page um, and look seamless when it comes off the page, like uh, a background or something. Um, and you want um, it to look like it was actually printed off the edge of the page, then you're going to want to add a bleed to your document. And this is where you'll do it. Um, uh, the typical bleed for a project is 1 .2, uh, uh, 0.125 inches or one eighth of an inch. Okay. So um, with my little um, uh, link here uh, selected, all of these. Um, uh, boxes for the top, bottom, left, and right bleeds um, area will be uh, auto-populated. We'll hit create. So you can see it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit um, in a different proportion here. So what we're looking at here is the red edge. And let me see if you can see that real good. Let me zoom in. So this red edge here is the bleed edge. Okay, so this is actually off of the pasteboard or off of the edge of the paper. If I was to draw a box, so in InDesign, um, if I hit the letter M, just like I would with the rectangle tool in Photoshop or the um, uh, shape rectangle tool in Illustrator, um, M is the same shortcut in InDesign. It's going to create a rectangle tool. Um, here where I can just create a rectangle or otherwise I can create a perfect uh, square. So I'm going to draw this rectangle. It doesn't have a fill color. Here's where I can capture my colors. I can double click this icon here on the bottom left and I'll be able to see uh, my color space here. Um, I can choose my colors uh, by CMYK conversion here or I can kind of use uh, uh, RGB as well. Um, I've seen uh, websites um, be 
uh, designed and InDesign. Um, just to show a client really quick what a website would look like once developed, um, you can essentially show a prototype of a website here very quickly, much more quickly than you would when you had to uh, develop something. Um, so I can kind of drag this around and, and find a color just like you would Photoshop or something like that. Hit OK and then your, your uh, shape is complete. Notice that I don't have this shape coming off the bleed edge, okay? Um, I have it going right up to the edge of the pasteboard. But what I'm doing is see, the way I can the reason why I can see these um, lines is I'm I'm seeing the invisibles of this file. Um, so let me save this real quick on my desktop. If I hit W, otherwise if um, if I want to use the menu, I can just go down here and then see preview mode. I can click and hold and see just the bleed here. Here's the bleed edge, right? Slug, etc. So um, normal is showing my invisibles and preview is showing um, just the artwork on the, on the palette. Okay, um, again, W, we'll turn that on and off. So in preview mode here, it looks like my art is coming off the edge. Like in, but in reality, if I was to put this on a, on a press um, and send it to the press person, it would come back looking very much like something like this. You would have the print coming up almost to the edge, but not quite. It would, look, it would basically look like that if you did not add a bleed to it. Essentially, when I send a project to a printer, they will print an eight and a half by 11 sheet um, of artwork onto a paper that is slightly a little bit bigger than eight and a half by 11, okay? And then they will add crop marks to the edges of that to um, then cut the design out of that slightly larger than eight and a half by 11 size piece of paper. That's what gives you the illusion that the artwork is bleeding off of the edge or coming off of the edge of the paper. So to make sure that the printer has enough ink beyond the crop area, which is represented here by, let me zoom in because the screen is a little bit not noticeable, this black here, this thin black line, um, in order to actually have my artwork come off the edge, I'm going to have to actually drag this box if I want my artwork to be green in the background all the way to that red bleed mark edge. Okay, um, again because if I want it to be nine inches wide by five inches tall and I want this artwork to bleed off of the edge, I want it to be larger than that, this box will have to be 1.25 inches larger this way, 1.25 inches larger that way, and then so on and so forth on the top and the bottom. Uh, so in a total, adding a quarter of an inch to my width and height, making this not just nine by five tall, it's actually nine and a quarter by five and a quarter tall. That's the size of the file that you would send to the printer. They would print it at 9.25 by 5.25, and then they would cut it down to nine by five. Does that make sense? So it's important to have a bleed, and that's how um, you would establish that. Typically, I would work in this preview mode a lot of the time. Um, otherwise, but I, I will go a lot, you know, back and forth here. Now let's see what else we got um, uh, here. I'm going to go over this Pages palette here. Pages allows you to add uh, multiple pages to the document. Okay. Um, so if you remember, we had in our catalog piece, in the pages palette, the pages are facing. So you have one page on one side of the gutter, the other page on the other side of the gutter, okay? But if I add a page, it's just coming in, when you don't have facing pages checked, um, it's just going to add a page right behind it, okay? So this is essentially a front and back 
um, single-sided uh, document here that I'm designing. Uh, so this would be typical for a postcard. So um, I'm going to just copy and then and then uh, edit paste in place here on page two. So I'm jumping back and forth on these pages. This is very much like a, um, a layer in Photoshop, if you will, if you could kind of think of it that way. If I double click page two and do an edit paste in place, I'm placing whatever I copied from page one to page two, okay? Um, let, me, uh, let me just change the color up a little bit, okay? So, um, and then so on and so forth, I can just add more pages and whatever's highlighted here in my pages palette is, is what is going to be active, or is what is active on my uh, pasteboard, is what we call. So, um, let's see, what else? Um, master pages are a little bit different. Ma a master page is really, um, it's up here in the pages palette. If I wanted to, um, say for instance, kind of uh, fix this up here. Oh, sorry. So if I, for instance, wanted to um, add a page number to every single page here, one through six, right? Um, so what I'm doing, it looks like I'm, I'm, design, I'm starting to design a postcard that um, actually um, has a couple different versions. So Pages one and two here could be one version of the postcard. Pages three and four could be another version, and pages five and six could be another version. And I could send this to a printer once completed and say, you know, printer, um, I'd like to uh, print pages one and two 100 times, three and four 200 times, and five and six 300 times, um, you know, if, if that's what um, I wanted to do for that job. Um, so let me just kind of go ahead and, and copy and paste the back page uh, background to every every page here. So again, I'm just kind of jumping or I'm using my spacebar to use my grabber tool just like an illustrator and then moving page for page and just pasting in place what I've copied. So I'm going to copy this with a, an edit copy, double clicking page three and then I'm going to do edit paste in place double click on page five and doing an edit paste in place and then page six. So I have three different uh, identical designs at this point. Under master pages, if I double click this, you now you can see my panel is just completely gone, okay? Um, and so that's fine. So maybe on page two, four, and six, um, I want to have something uh, different happening um, in the corner, okay? So let me see. Um, I'm going to use my type tool actually. I'm going to do a page number here. So I'm going to click and drag with my text tool and I'm going to do some placeholder text, just three X's here. And I'm going to just format this text a little bit so it formats just the same as any other um, uh, program that you have used, um, Illustrator and so on, except I can edit this text up here in this panel um, otherwise, I can go to window and then type in tables and then use uh, character, the character um, uh, panel to just edit uh, uh, typefaces, kerning, and this type of thing. Um, let me kind of pick a font here. And, um, and then I can open up my uh, para uh, paragraph uh, uh, panel 2, again under window, type in tables, and paragraph, and then that panel will come up. I can just put them together with the, the character piece, um, and then I can do, you know, just a little bit more so um, I can, you know, justify this stuff, right and left align, and so on and so forth. I just added um, some, I just centered that. That's basically it. I just want to center it in the box. Okay. So I'm going to bring this down. Now since this is showing up on my master page, it should essentially show up. Let's put it here like a page number. It's going to show up on every single other page. Uh, so master pages are really um, places where I can put universal pieces of artwork. Okay, So page numbers are very common to do here. Um, so I put my page number on master page A and I'm going to just double click on page one, jump out here. 
And I'm going to go to page two and see that I have the shape that's overlapping the master page layer. Okay, so the master page layer is actually behind this panel here. So if I wanted this panel um, to essentially show up on every page but be behind the text that I put on my master page, I could copy it, delete it, jump to my master page, paste in place. Now I can go to object, arrange, and then send back. So this will send this all the way back on the master page and now look at my thumbnails. They're all green now because this master page is overriding the artwork on each page. So what can I do? Um, if I have enough, enough pages that I need to use a master page for the design, um, I'll create another master page and this is called BMaster. Okay. Uh, so let me actually take BMaster, which is blank, and actually apply it to every other page here, okay, for the back of this, each of these different versions of postcard. So I actually can drag and then drop master B onto page two, and you can see now we're back to the original uh, minus uh, the, this little um, uh, page number marker here. So I'm going to do that for every single one. I'm going to delete the original art here. So master page background is, is overriding everything. And I'll go to master page A again. And I really want page numbers, right, on here. So I'm going to then copy it and then go to master page B and then edit paste in place here. And so now master page B is going to have this little text piece. If I want to get real technical about it, I would just copy and cut that in that and then paste that in the master page too. And this is only if I wanted a consistent uh, background amongst these pages in a design. So essentially, um, in your catalog piece, you could uh, design uh, your common background elements on the master page and then not have to do any copying and pasting between page for page. So um, again, like uh, page numbers and then like, you know, uh, backgrounds, um, background uh, textures and so on and so forth. So we want this to be a page number, okay. So I'm going to jump into the master page and I'm going to zoom in here, so uh, it's uh, command, uh, command space bar, click and drag to, um, to do my uh, zoom there. I'm going to select this text, and I'm going to go up into the type menu. I'm going to insert special characters. This is where I can actually insert um, uh, page numbers uh, without actually having to do it manually. I just have it automatically number of pages. Um, so, let's see, it's under markers, and then it's under current page number. You can click on that. And then let's see, that's applied to master page A. Alright, so master page A here, I have number one, and, and so what's unique is these numbers here, when you have current page number as your marker, um, it's going to actually match up to the page number in your pages palette. Now I'll show you, in the template, um, my page numbers in my page in my uh, pages palette um, uh, go numbers one two three four and then they restart at page five at um, and number at one two three four five all the way to twenty. So that's on purpose because I wanted to start the page numbering later on in the book. I didn't want to count the front cover as page one because the first inside page would be then page two. So I wanted to restart the numbering, and I'll show you how I do that um, uh, later on in, when we go over the more advanced stuff later. But as I'm going through, you'll notice that, um, that this page that has master uh, page B applied, right, this, this little sidebar with, uh, um, with the, uh, the temporary page number that I put in there um, with X's, um, it's not. It's not. It's not showing up. That's because I didn't apply. I didn't insert that special character to make the current page number um, uh, uh, marked automatically on 
this B master page template. So I'll just basically do the same. I'm going to select B master here, um, all that text in, in that place I want to put my current page number. And I'll go again, insert special character sim, uh, markers, and then current page number. And then we'll jump back to um, master page B, page two, and then, and then you can see we have uh, these pages numbered just the way they are. Okay. Now, if I go to page six and I go down here and do create new page and start clicking, you can see all of my pages are just basically numbering themselves forever and ever. I don't have to worry about adding numbers per page or any of that. Um, and obviously they're all, you know, styled to master page B, so then I can just kind of drag the artwork for master page A if I wanted even more versions. Again, I'm just kind of dragging the common art here. Uh, maybe you have like a mailing panel or something with mailing address or whatever. You can save it on, I mean, you could, you could basically have um, one InDesign document that has um, you know, postcards that a brand owner does year after year, you know, for infinity. And you would just um, have one document and you say, oh yeah, I've done this postcard last year. I'm just going to update some content, send it to the printer and be done with it all in one file if you, if you actually wanted to, right? So that's a little bit of that. Um, I'll go uh, show you some more of these uh, panels here. Um, very much like, um, let me do a new master and then just keep it blank. I actually know why we do that. I'll just do this. Um, let's say I'll go to, um, let me place a file. So just a, a file place. Um, let's say we want to do like a, let's see what we got here. I want to do some social media buttons, let's just say. So I'm going to click all of these different social media buttons here, um, or icons, I guess, and then just hit open. Um, um, these are all PNG files, so they're on transparent backgrounds, which works out for me. So I clicked, I basically clicked one of those files, and then I hit hold, held shift, and then clicked the last one in the listing. And it's selected all four. And the way I know that all four are selected is you can see I have a number four here on my little loader, my little pointer here. And so as I click, I can just, I can just start placing this art. Just click after click. So this one is sized up really big, but these are really small. So this is a good situation. So I have all these, um, these icons. But this one's at a different size, right? I want it to be consistent. So if I click on this LinkedIn icon and I look up here um, in this palette, it's going to show me the properties of this, um, this artwork. Um, so if I look, my width is 0.333 inches, height 333 inches, perfect square. And I'm going to click this Facebook icon. It's one, you know, 1.3 inches by 1.3 inches. Okay, uh, fine. So I'm just going to click this LinkedIn icon again, and I'm going to copy this width, and I'm going to just go to Facebook here, and I'm going to actually um, click this little lock icon. Uh, this lock icon here next to these measurements are going to make sure that whatever I place here in the width and paste and hit enter, it's going to place here in the height. So this is actually... Uh, now my Facebook icon image um, uh, within a little box here. So I'll add an outline of this box just to give you a, a, a taste of the size of it better. So this isn't good because it's actually cropping the Facebook um, uh, you know, logo down to where it's not noticeable anymore. This quick way of just fitting it into the box within proportions is just click on it and then go to, um, uh, let's see, it's object, and then it's uh, fitting here. And then, so this is all the fitting options that you can get, and so what we wanna do is fit the content in the frame proportionally. Uh, so if I hit this, that's gonna size down, and that option again was object, fitting, and then it was uh, fit 
content proportionally. And so the shortcut for this is Command Shift Option E. And so I, that's a shortcut I've memorized because I, I use it a lot. Um, and that's one that I'd actually recommend uh, uh, use, uh, memorizing as well. So I just took the stroke off of, off of my shape here, um, uh, or my bounding box around the object, and, and now I'm good to go. Um, InDesign being like a page, a page layout program, it's all about alignments. So um, uh, InDesign is going to help you align things. So if I can bring this graphic down, you can see these little, little guides that are kind of popping up automatically showing me that I'm centered uh, next to this Facebook logo. Um, I'm going to bring this other one. You can see I'm centered and I have even spacing on both sides. It's, it's giving me that preview and I can just let go and be confident that that's um, going to be exactly uh, uh, evenly distributed uh, like so. Um, you know, again, so if, I'm, if I was designing a website, um, I could easily show someone, you know, what I'm, what I'm thinking. You know, otherwise I can just use it in a printed piece or whatever. To make this a little larger. Um, yeah, more more tools here. So um, let me zoom in a little bit more. This is a pretty important piece to take away with here. Um, selection and direct selection tools, all capable in this uh, program. So let me um, let me go ahead and just do a file place again. I'm going to place uh, something else. Uh, Let's see. There's my. Mm, I'll just do this one. Just place this right here. Place it off to the side. Scale it down. All right. So I'm scaling this little image down here. Okay. Um, when I hover over this, you can see a circle, right? You can see the little hand um, symbol coming out. Um, so I'm hovering over this in the center, and I have my hand symbol uh, appearing. And I can actually click and grab the image in the background and move it around. So I'm going to show you. Um, now that when I click on this image outside of this little box that shows up on my hover um, and I add a stroke to it, I'll make this stroke larger so it's more visible, now you can see that the size of my bounding box is one, uh, is one way, but the image within is a little bit, um, uh, is a little bit off. So essentially the key takeaway here is, is that um, when you place an image in InDesign, it actually places it into its own bounding box, okay? Um, and the image within the bounding box can be moved independently from the bounding box itself, okay? Um, so I can move this around like that, okay, now I have a new crop, right? Um, and then I can click this bounding box outside of it, outside of that circle piece, right? And then I can actually move the bounding box as a whole. So essentially, if I wanted to, um, you know, create just a sort of a collage of just boxes um, at an equal size, I can make them one inch by one inch. Oh, that wasn't valid, I guess. Uncheck that. There we go. Okay, and then I um, and then I um, selected this image in the middle of the box here, um, and moved it around. I can actually scale it independently of the bounding box in the background. So um, again, I just kind of um, uh, hovered over this box, saw that I have my circle um, on my hand uh, symbol coming out. I can just click it, and I can see the image box showing up around. Now I can hit scale, which is S. So if I hit S, just like an illustrator, otherwise I can go over here and just hit the scale tool. Um, I can click somewhere on the pasteboard, wherever I want. I'll just click this top right corner. 
Um, that'll be my um, anchor point. And I'll just click way outside of here and then drag it in. I'm holding the shift key to constrain the proportions of the image within the box. Um, if I don't hold the shift key and do the same thing, I can actually warp this image within the box. So instead of hovering over it and just clicking on the image within the box like that, um, you can actually just use your direct selection tool as well. And then you can click anywhere uh, outside of the box or inside of the box or what have you to move this object around in the box too. So real basic stuff, but it can kind of trip you up if, if, if you're not aware of like what's happening. So again, I want to make this larger, I'll move it around, scale it up. It can get frustrating if, you, if you're not understanding that there is actually an image within an image box here at all times. Now, exceptions for that um, would be vector artwork. Uh, so I can drag in um, a piece of vector art and still be able to edit the, um, the artwork. So let me see if I can find like a logo. Uh, I don't know if I have a uh, logo. Oh, this will work. Um, so I'll open up this AI file and just drag it in. All right, so I'll just select it and then just drag and drop. Okay, so I just dragged and dropped that. I'm seeing my invisibles here. I'll drag it out to the pasteboard so you can see it a little better. So you can see all the points and paths creating the logo here um, uh, as well. So um, I can hit my direct selection tool here in the palette. Uh, otherwise, I can just use the shortcut A and then I can you know, um, manipulate these points and paths, this vector-based artwork uh, like I would, you know, an illustrator or something like that. Um, that's because this content is outlined and so on. So, um, all right. So you can do that. Um, I can actually um, very simply place that artwork as well. So um, let me go ahead and do that. I'll bring this to my desktop and then place it. Um, let me go ahead and uh, just delete this. I'll go um, change my background color because it's kind of, just bring it back to white here. Oh. Here's my master page. All right. So um, now to formally place this, I'm um, just going to go to File, Place again, and just like I did with my PNG files, um, I'll just do the same with this AI file. Just hit Open. Now it's loaded right in my selector. I can just place it, and, and there you go. Now I'm hovering over it, and now it's vector art, but I can't manipulate the, the pixels, or I'm sorry, the points and paths with my direct selection tool. So. So that's the um, disadvantage of placing um, uh, vector art just like you would like an image in InDesign. You're not going to be able to um, edit the points and paths directly in InDesign. Um, you know, there's some good and bad with that. I mean, I can open I can open this linked file in Illustrator and make a change to it, right? If I wanted to update this art on an individual basis, just directly from Illustrator, um, or I could just work with it, you know, like that. So um, let me just jump back to the original so you can tell if my original is on the desktop. I'll just double click it to open it up um, and then just make a quick change. Uh, let's see, where's my wand here? Let me just see what happens. Oops. Save it and then just come back to InDesign and then see the update. So I just made a change to this original artwork and you can see it, it kind of gets real pixelated right now. That's because it, InDesign is really warning me that there's something up with this, um, this artwork file, okay? 
So let me go to links, my links panel that's found here right next to the page is real convenient. Um, and then I'll pull this artwork out, you hear this panel out, and you can see um, that I have this, you know, it looks like a yield sign basically, right? Um, so if I hover over it, I have a, a message, right, saying, you know, this is modified, double click to update. So I can update that just like that. So I'll just double click it, and then the artwork is now updated and crisp. Uh, so um, InDesign is telling me this is this is good to go. Um, if I had a one of those stop sign images here, um, and I'll show you what that looks like actually, just by going like this, taking my original artwork and throwing it in the trash. InDesign is looking for that artwork, and it's saying this is not here. It's not connected. So um, this is where um, having an organized file structure comes into handy. If you have a one common uh, folder that you keep all of your assets in and you just place into InDesign from that common folder, you're never going to run into the situation where you have to say, oh my gosh, my file is missing, click on the missing file, and then go down to this relink. Okay, relink. Now i got to go searching for what happened to it. I don't even know. It's deleted. So um, I, I'm kind of at my wit's end, right? I'd have to go and, and figure out uh, where I can pull something like this from. So, um, and I have no idea where where to start. Let's, uh, yeah, can't find it. Where's my uh, hard drive? It is in my hard drive, but yeah. So um, you just want to make sure that it's really, uh, really convenient. And, and your workflow is real easy and organized. Just try and stay organized as much as you can. Um, let's see, uh, drawing tools. So I can drag uh, Illustrator files into InDesign. I can draw into InDesign too um, uh, using vector artwork, right? So pen tool, um, if I click here and expand, I can see I have the add anchor point and delete anchor point tool. Uh, in InDesign as well if I wanted to do that. So let me just draw uh, with the pen tool to demo um, just a real organic shape here. Um, uh, apply a color. Oh, and then, uh, yeah, no problem. And then I can, you know, with the pen tool again, just like any other software pro, I can just do straight lines as well. Uh, this eyedropper here in design uh, allows you to select the eyedropper. Um, the shortcut for that is the letter I. Um, but selecting the eyedropper with an object um, selected onto your pasteboard, you can just cl uh, click on another object and then apply the exact settings you have uh, there um, onto it. So I'm actually copying the fill and then copying the stroke from this object just by having this selected and selecting the eyedropper tool and clicking over there. So subtly change the color a bit, eyedropper tool with this selected, and I can match those up. Um, like in Illustrator 2, I can click on an object and then hold the Alt key. And remember, I got my um, arrow kind of doubling up with the black and white. Then I can click and drag um, another copy of that object uh, onto the uh, pasteboard, scale it down, um, uh, rotate it. So with R. Uh, the shortcut R, I can have my rotate tool, click anywhere there, and then just uh, rotate that around. Uh, holding on this shift key while I rotate will constrain it to 45 degree angles, right? So I'm just snapping to 45 degree angles here. Otherwise, when I let go of shift as I'm moving around, it'll just kind of free flow uh, apply. Okay. So another one um, that might come in handy uh, too, well, let me kind of show you, um, of course, all of our shape tools, uh, just like um, all uh, on the other uh, Illustrator, um, will have uh, different shapes uh, within this palette. If you just kind of hold it, you see kind of that lower right hand arrow pointing. You can just hold it and, and, and draw other shapes as well specifically in this case the polygon. I'm pressing the left and right keys to mul duplicate these polygons. Uh, so you can do that for any of your shapes too uh, if you wanted to. 
Um, let's see. So um, I'm just going to draw a shape here. Um, typically with uh, text, I'll just kind of um, use my text tool, draw a box, right, just like you would any other program. Um, type it out in your in your box there. When I deselect it by um, uh, selecting the selection tool in the menu box, uh, my type tool isn't selected, so I can't like type and then have you know um, uh, text be edited here. Um, just uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, if I uh, have my selection tool with the type box selected, um, I will um, click on that type box and actually just drag the entire type box with it. I'm not actually selecting the type. I have to either double click this type within the box to get my type tool selected um, and select my type and change it up. Um, or I'd have to uh, go here and click my type tool literally in the palette and then just go over my type and just click it like that. Um, again, uh, type faces are all up here. Otherwise, you can open up your type palette. Uh, but let's see if I can, um, I can search up type faces by name here. So I'll just do a Helvetica bold. Um, color for type uh, is, is treated um, basically exactly the same as any other shape. Um, I'm going to have my type tool selected. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, my text box selected here. So I'm moving this thing around. Um, and I'm going to go over and hit this um, uh, symbol here, just the type symbol, but it's miniaturized down below. And if I hit that, now my um, uh, two swatch icons here in the corner um, and I wish I could zoom in on on that for you but um, if you look real close um, uh, this has turned into basically a T so um, it's telling me that now I have this box uh, this text box selected but now I'm targeting the type okay so now I can change my text color within the box uh, you know however I want I'll scale this up Um, I'm going to click this text box and nudge around with the arrow keys, okay. Um, I can actually adjust um, uh, the, uh, uh, the size of my nudge spacing. Uh, so let me select both of these and then group them. So if you remember last time, um, uh, we can do a Command G, other, uh, you have a Command G on the Mac or Control G on the PC. Otherwise, if you go up here in an object and hit group, it'll just group it. You know it's grouped because you have these little dotted lines around them. Um, ungroup, Command Shift G will ungroup them and it can break them apart. Okay. Um, what was I going to do? Yeah, so any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, gosh, what is it? 